Digwit August Tau Falcherov. Falcherov, Quig Ceremonus, Flaws Lagan, August Comaru, Common Guelta, Minan Adeg, August Ashadeg, Sigardine, Quivna Coin, Bolya Clear. Welcome to the 1916 Relatives Association wreath laying and commemoration ceremony in the Garden of Remembrance, Dublin. 2020 will be remembered for one thing only, the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic caused the cancellation of all national Easter 1916 commemoration ceremonies, ceremonies and events, including our association's annual event held here each Easter Saturday. We, the Executive Committee of the 1916 Relatives Association, at that time, made the decision that we would not allow anything during this year to prevent us from honouring, remembering and commemorating our relatives. After all, our relatives did not let anything stand in their way or deter them from their tasks, or prevent them from turning out Easter 1916. Not even MacNeil's commanding order, or should I say countermanding order. And so that decision leads us here today to the Garden of Remembrance, adhering to the guidelines of the, National, of the Health, Exer Health, Exe Health Service Executive and the government restrictions. We are unfortunately without an audience and without the usual great gathering of our association members which we have come to expect. However, we do have some very special guests who honour the 1916 Relatives Association and our relatives of 1916 by attending with us here today. This commemoration would not be complete without their participation. The video recording of today's event will be watched by our association members in the four corners of the island of Ireland and by our members spread all over the world. We welcome most sincerely Dublin City Lord Mayor Hazel Chu. Lord Mayor Hazel we are deeply honoured by your attendance here today. You, cont you continue what has become a tradition for our, for our event, whereby the sitting Dublin City Lord Mayor attends and lays a wreath on behalf of the citizens of Dublin in remembrance of our relatives. We thank you most sincerely for adding our event to your busy schedule. A wreath will also be laid on behalf of the 1916 Relatives Association by our Executive Committee member, Brenda O'Neill. I also extend a welcome to Jim Doyle, President of the 1621 Club, and Mr Larry Urell, representing the National Graves Association. Jim Doyle will lay a wreath on behalf of the 1621 Club and Larry Urell will lay a wreath on behalf of the National Graves Association. Also with us today, the journalist, author and filmmaker, Frank Schaudice, who will read the proclamation. Frank, you are very welcome. Frank is a member of the 1916 Relatives Association and it is his grandfather, also known as Frank, who was part of the Four Courts Garrison in 1916 and was the subject of our Frank's wonderfully written book, Grandpa the Sniper. We extend a very well, warm welcome to the well-known author, author and journalist, Martina Devlin. Martina kindly honours our association by delivering an address to us today. Our beautiful singers are Kira Burke and Ruby O'Kelly. 
Ladies, thank you for your contribution to our event. Now, I know the girls are social distancing in the wings there somewhere, and their performance will be recorded for the video after the ceremonial part of our event. In keeping with tradition, we welcome retirees of Oglock Naharan, the Irish Defence Forces. Today's Oglock Naharan are the descendants of the Irish Volunteers, and they are represented by Sergeant Anthony Byrne, Pipe Major of the Pipe Band of Iomba, the Irish United Nations Veterans Association and our four flag bearers who are also members of the Dublin Brigade Irish Volunteers Reenactment Group. These gentlemen and lady join us straight from Glasnevin Cemetery where they were tending the grave of Michael Collins, a task they do each and every Saturday morning. I would like now to start proceedings by unveiling the new standard of the 1916 Relatives Association. I welcome and invite the renowned artist Mr Robert Balla to bring the standard forward. This standard has been designed by the Executive Committee of our Association. By kind permission of Robert Balla, because we took the burning GPO from the original emblem of our Association and used it in the flag. We owe a great debt of gratitude to our Association Executive Committee member, Michael Empey, who took the design of our standard to the flag makers and had this magnificent standard made. From now, the standard will be paraded at every event at which the 1916 Relatives Association is represented. I now invite Frank Shouldice to read the proclamation. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and of the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. Having organised and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organisation, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and through her open military organisations, the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army, having patiently perfected her discipline, having resolutely waited for the right moment to reveal itself, she now seizes that moment and, supported by her exiled children in America and by gallant allies in Europe, but relying in the first on her own strength, she strikes in full confidence of victory. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. In every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty 
Six times during the past 300 years they have asserted it in arms, standing on that fundamental right and again asserting it in arms. In the face of the world we hereby proclaim the Irish Republic as a sovereign independent state and we pledge our lives and the lives of our comrades in arms to the cause of its freedom, of its welfare and of its exaltation among nations. The Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and of all its parts, cherishing all of the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government which have divided a minority from a majority in the past. Until our arms have brought the opportune moment for the establishment of a permanent national government, representative of the whole people of Ireland and elected by the suffrages of all her men and women, the provisional government hereby constituted will administer the civil and military affairs of the Republic in trust for the people. We place the cause of the Irish Republic under the protection of the Most High God, whose blessing we invoke upon our arms and we pray that no one who serves that cause will dishonour it by cowardice, inhumanity or rapine. In this supreme hour the Irish nation must, by its valour and discipline and by the readiness of its children to sacrifice themselves for the common good, prove itself worthy of the august destiny to which it is called. Signed on behalf of the Provisional Government Thomas Clark, Sean McDermott, Thomas McDonough, Porrick Pierce, Eamon Kant, James Connolly, Joseph Plunkett. I invite Martina Devlin to make her address. History never fails to turn, and it's turning currently. The status quo has changed beyond recognition as a result of the pandemic and Brexit, which means it's an opportunity to imagine a new Ireland. Let's call it a reunion rather than reunification. Reunion is a joyful meeting. It implies absence and return. Standing here today, I can envisage that reunion between the two peoples who share this island. I, I don't pretend it will be a journey that's entirely smooth, but it's the direction of travel that's important. And really, we've been separated from one another for too long. We're two sides of the one coin, and together we're stronger. Barriers have grown up that have no place in the modern world. But with the passage of time, we now have a democratic and peaceful way to see whether we can finish what was started at Easter 1916. To do that, we need to have a series of conversations about the future. Not for romantic Ireland, four green fields reasons but because events are driving change and it's better to shape change rather than let the cards fall where they will maybe there could be a shared economy wouldn't that deliver better outcomes for all uh, it would deliver them in health education and jobs. First though, 
we should talk about the shape of any possible new constitutional arrangements for the island of Ireland, whether that's a unitary state, a federal setup, or whatever. We need to examine the political systems on both sides of the island. There's a tried and trusted way to deliver change, which is always challenging. And that's via the Citizens' Assembly model. It's a structured discussion forum, a mechanism to assess public attitudes to proposals. This Citizens' Assembly would need to be all island and cross community, put together on a representative basis. And it would need to operate in conjunction with focused, government-led planning to implement any changes agreed by citizens. Agreed is the key word here. Ireland is an international leader in the citizens' assemblies. Our political scientists fly around the world advising on them. What's stopping us here at home? Their grassroots participative democracy in action. A way of putting everything out there on the table. Hopes and fears. Emblems and anthems. P potential gains and losses. Fundamentally, what a reimagined Ireland might look like. A pivotal first step is to talk to people about their concerns. And if a case is to be made for new arrangements, we must show how they can work for everyone. Fears need to be addressed about higher taxes, diminished healthcare entitlements, loss of identity. I'm conscious as I stand here with that tricolour just ahead of me, that it's been a building block in the construction of the state. Quite literally, it's been the flag that was planted on the mountaintop of independence. It has served us well, but maybe it's outlived its usefulness. Now might be a good time to consider new symbols for a reconfigured Ireland, ones that carry no baggage. Let's think about our unionist friends here. This flag is not a symbol they can rally around, and a new Ireland must be fair to all. But it's an opportunity to think of new symbols. We have fantastic artists and creatives in Ireland, Robert Bala is sitting just a few feet away from me. We could put out a public call to devise new symbols. Reunion will require us to alter our republic and some people will find that difficult. But we need to make space for all in a genuine and inclusive way. We have to be generous. Do this with a heart and a half. It can't be a case of bolting on partitioned counties. An immediate border pole isn't realistic. We can't call for one in the new year and have the vote before Easter. But planning for constitutional change is responsible and setting a target for a border poll is an opportunity and not a threat. A chance for each side to make their case and share their vision. But at some stage, there does need to be a vote, north and south, just as happened with the Good Friday Agreement. And shouting down such a proposal is narrow-minded. Can voting ever be wrong or dangerous? It's the essence of democracy.
if a new Ireland is born from these discussions and the voting that follows, we must make space willingly within it for Britishness. Be welcoming, respectful. Fashion ways in which unionism is comfortable alongside nationalism. It's not beyond us. Our history shows us the impossible can be made possible. If Irish and British identities can coexist in Northern Ireland, surely they can coexist on an equal footing in a new Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement has the answer. I'm quoting here, it undertakes to recognize the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both as they may so choose. Why not give unionists the same right to dual identity within an agreed Ireland? The Republic might consider incorporating the 12th of July as a public holiday. That's maturity. It's saying, your shibboleths don't threaten me. There's room for all. And there are other conversations we need to have. How you'd amalgamate education, the legal system, the police force, civil service, workers' rights, learning from best practice in each. COVID-19 has taught us the importance of a common approach in public health policy. It's not hard to see how reunion could be advantageous for both parts of this island. But before reunionism, there must be outreach to unionism. Political unionism isn't keen. It must be acknowledged to consider the part it might play in a reimagined Ireland. The status quo is appealing whatever the circumstances. But the idea of a new Ireland is becoming more mainstream. Older people, some older people I should say, might be reluctant on both sides of the ideological river. But young people and those who've settled here from other countries don't share those reservations. We should look to them seek their input. Often they regard themselves as European or some other identity as well as Irish or British. So, at the end of the day, people aren't dreaming about shamrocks and harps or lambeg drums and Union Jack bunting. They just trying to earn a living and see a better world shape, take shape. One where they can move towards their best possible version of the future. Reunion on our shared island could be a place where all citizens, whether orange or green or neither, have a chance to thrive. Wouldn't that be worth commemorating in a symbolic setting like this? One where, not so long ago, God Save the Queen and Iron Nevein were played on the same occasion. We live in hope. But we don't just stargaze. We also take steps to make our hopes possible. Thank you. I now invite Dublin City Lord Mayor Hazel Chew to lay a wreath on behalf of the citizens of Dublin.
our Executive Committee member, Brenda O'Neill, to lay a wreath on behalf of the 1916 Relatives Association. Jim Doyle, to lay a wreath on behalf of the 1621 Club. Larry Urell, to lay a wreath on behalf of the National Graves Association. We will now observe one minute's silence, followed by a piper's lament. The national flag on the monument to your left will be raised to full mast, and then the national anthem will be played. Please stand.
This concludes our commemoration. But before we go our separate ways, I wish to thank Dublin City Lord Mayor Hazel Tugh for attending our event and honouring our relatives of 1916. Can we also ask you, Lord Mayor Hazel, to convey our heartfelt gratitude to all the staff in the office of Dublin City Lord Mayor. The help, guidance and courtesy shown to the 1916 Relatives Association and our Executive Committee members is exemplary, no matter what our request might be. Thank you also to our guests, Jim Doyle and Larry Urell, and to our participants in the ceremony today, Frank Scholdice, Martina Devlin, Robert Balla, Kira Burke, Ruby O'Kelly, Robbie McAnny from the Irish Defence Forces Veterans News for the video recording and production, to Anthony Byrne the Pike Major, Jim Langton, Terry Crosby, Lynn Brady, Dermot O'Connor, Ronnie Daly. Thank you all very much. I also wish to thank the OPW who permit and provide us with the Garden of Remembrance every year for our association. And lastly, I wish to thank our Association Chairman, Brian O'Neill, and all the members of the Executive Committee of the 1916 Relatives Association, who have worked hard to make this event a success today. And all I have left now is to wish everybody, whether you're at home or, or abroad, to stay well, Stay safe and stay out of the virus zones. Burmian Mahogan.
had those fearless men but few who bore the fight for freedom for right might shine through the foggy My heart with for we parted then with valiant men whom I ne'er shall see no and to and fro in my dreams I go as I kneel and pray for you. Oh, grace, just hold me in your 